Effective communication as an engineer is one of your most important assets. And the university hasn't equipped you with the skills you require to effectively communicate as a professional out in the field. The university has only really equipped you for the skill set for academic writing and presenting. Where out in the field, you have a broad range of people that you need to focus your ideas to. So you do not necessarily have the skill set you require to be an effective communicator for a broad range of audience that your information needs to go to. I'll be covering some techniques behind how to be more effective communicator in the written form. These will be things to avoid, some things to focus on, and also some ways to be able to proofread your documents easier. So how to speed up that whole process. This is something that I built up over my 15 years experience and something that I really had to work on. Because my written form communication wasn't the best, probably like many other engineers, and this has really helped improve my writing by leaps and bounds. This is stuff potentially that you've also never heard of. Make sure you listen all the way through to the end because I'm sure you'll find it informative because I know I have. My name is Brendan, and you're a structural engineer based in Australia. I know I produce videos that help progress your career faster and just general interest topics around structural engineering. So if you do like that type of content, please don't forget to subscribe and let's get into it. Probably one of the biggest things that I learned when I was going through improving my writing was something that we learned at university was actually the complete opposite to what you should be doing. And that is justification of text. Now, as engineers, when we see the text justification, it looks nice and square. And it's something that we're really drawn to. However, it really wrecks the flow of reading because what it does, it spaces out the words differently, which makes it hard to read quickly. So it makes it really hard to digest the document they've actually written. So something that I really encourage you is do not justify your text ever. And you try and read through it and you'll find that you'll be able to read documents a lot easier if they're set up this way. So this is something that university has put together that is actually completely wrong. Now, when you are actually writing that text, you do need to put it in a logical order as well, but this is something potentially that you have been equipped at university. So you need your intro, your body and conclusion. And when you're writing your paragraphs, they need to be in some logical order to build up a story. I'll not cover this in too much detail, as this is potentially something you already have the skill set for. And this is more around focusing on some tips you potentially never heard of and help rest your writing more effectively. There's many different forms of communication that we have as engineers, whether that be email, technical reports, design reviews, or site reports. And each of them serve different purposes and will have different tones. However, each of them, you should spend just as much effort in putting them together. Yes, an email, will be shorter and should not be as big as a report. However, making sure that you're effectively communicating in that email is still important. So putting just as much effort as you would in a report into that email. Yes, the tones will be different in each of these. So an email will be more casual, where a report will be more formal, and the site report may even be more authoritative. But making sure you're focusing on the quality of that communication is really important. I would also encourage you to focus a lot on emails as well and put as just much effort into that email as you would that technical report. Yes, the email will be a lot shorter and be a lot less formal as well. However, making sure you're still being a very effective communicator in your emails. As this is something that you go back and forth with the client a lot. So it's something that reflects you and on the company. So making sure you're putting just as much effort around the words and how you're trying to structure that email is really important. As the more effective communicator you are, the better you're going to get along with your clients and the easier it is to move on to that next project. So before we start writing, we need to identify the audience that the communication is targeted for and what is the purpose of the writing we're putting together as well. How are you able to be a more effective communicator by identifying your audience? This is twofold. Firstly, it allows them to be able to relate more to the information as potentially you've taken their concerns into consideration and framed it around the issues that they're going to have. And also it gets you into their shoes and you may be able to find a solution that serves both your purposes, which will make them easy to accept whatever you're trying to put across. Also by identifying the audience, you're also able to work out the language that you're going to use in that communication. As if you're writing to an engineer, it's going to be more technical. An architect will also be framed differently and even a builder. So the language will change depending on who that information is targeted for. So let's start off by identifying a number of different audiences. And what are the problems to be a more effective writer that we need to target? Let's start off with an easy one. 
I'm a structural engineer, I'm trying to write my information to another structural engineer. So what are they looking for? They're really looking for those technical aspects. So what is the design methodology? How have I approached that design? If I made a side off observation, what are the key technical points that they need to know? Or if you're writing a report or a documentation, especially around design, really targeting those key technical aspects. So this is really something you've done at university. So this one should hopefully come quite easy. Let's start off with something now a little bit harder. Let's try another engineer. So I'm trying to target our information to a mechanical engineer. What are they looking for? Well, they need to get their ducts from a mechanical plant through to another area where they need to service with their air. So they need to get penetrations through your structure. So now that we've identified the problem they're having, how can we make our information more effective? Well, we can provide a diagram to them as we know they need to put penetrations through our structure. And this is something you may have seen in my earlier presentations. It's where I've come up with this traffic light system where we have red around a column where they must avoid or avoid at all costs at least because it will be a costly exercise for structure. Then we've got orange. Yes, there is structural issues there, but they're less so. And then we've got green where they can try and make a bigger penetration as possible. So it's really for them to try and prioritize where they can put their penetrations. Now, this information also needs to go to a third party as well. And that would be the architect. Now, architects and engineers is really where one of the biggest rivalry occurs. I think this fundamentally stems from neither of us understanding our problems. So what does the architect need to focus on? They want to make something that is aesthetically pleasing, functional and meets the client's needs. Whereas us as structural engineers, we really just want that thing to stand up. So if we were designing it, it'd just be a big square box with a linear line of columns everywhere. Is this really the easiest thing we can design? However, that building potentially will not be very aesthetically pleasing, nor very functional. What you got to also realize is the architect is also trying to meet the client's needs. So by addressing the concerns that the architect has, you're actually meeting your client's needs as well. So this is something that you should really be trying to focus on to be a more effective communicator, as it will not only help you build that structure, especially being a team player and working with the architect, but also show them that you are trying to meet the needs of the client. Sometimes we can also look at the architecture, but what is the problem they're trying to have and potentially come with a different solution that they haven't seen. So it might be something that actually make the building even more functional than what it's currently serving. And if you're able to do this, this is really where the best form of communication occurs and really where you can build your trust. Now, a lot of our communication is back and forth with the architect, especially through the early stages. But at the later stages, you need to go back and forth with the builder quite a lot. So what are the concerns of the builder? They're really concerned about time, budget and safety. And also the language you're going to use behind it is slightly different. So how are they going to put that structure together? And sometimes you also need to be more authoritative depending on the communication you're trying to put across. So sometimes you may need to say, we shall do this as they need to focus on it. Where other times you can be more lenient depending on what's happening. And you also got to realize that a building is put together by a group of people. It is not a switch wash. So something is not going to come together exactly how you want to document it. So you need to see it from their point of view that potentially they've got problems on site that they can't put it together in a certain way. So addressing it around that and trying to make things more buildable and seeing it from the builder's eyes. This will make your relationship with the builder better and will make the project more successful as really is a team event as you need to try and put a building together out on site with varying conditions. So as you can see, effective communication is really around identifying those audiences and structuring the sentences for it. And what you got to realize when we're putting together these big buildings, it is a team event. It's not just one person. It's a group of people coming together to get an successful design. So trying to step inside their shoes and identifying their problems will not only make your communication better, but also make that project run smoother. So it's really in your best interest to do this. Now that we've gone through identifying the audiences, we need to read through our documents and make sure that we're structuring our sentence effectively. I'm going to provide some tips here on how you can structure your sentences better. And this is really around two things. Firstly, it's about knowing a passive voice and active voice and when to use them. Most of the time, you want to be focusing on that active voice. But an active voice is more engaging and will make their audience relate to it. It's also normally more concise 
so it makes it easy to read as well. So let's look at these two examples. So the passive voice example is, a beam may be overloaded due to construction sequencing. You may need to tell the builder to restrict the load in this area to not overload the beam. As you can see, this is quite long. Now, if we were to and trying to move it to an active voice, it's really about trying to rewrite that sentence and it's normally trying to turn the sentence around a little bit as well. So if we were trying to structure this in more an active voice, to prevent the beam from being overloaded during construction, tell the builder to restrict the load in this area. As you can see here, we've got rid of a lot of words. It's, it's more concise and it's a lot easier to read. Now, how about another example? Again, we'll start off with a passive and then we'll work our way to that active voice. And it's really about restructuring that sentence as we were saying. So it's normally about turning the sentence back to front. So a lot of time you bring the stuff at the end to the front and move it around and you'll get a better sentence. So how about this example? If we go to the passive voice, it's the understanding of the builder that the reinforcement parallel to the beam must be in the bottom layer. Now, if we were to structure that as a more active sentence, the builder understood the reinforcement parallel to the beam must be in the bottom layer. As you can see, it's a lot shorter. So this does two things. By being active, you're getting more engagement. You also have less words there, so they're more likely to read the document that you've actually written. Another example is removing unnecessary words. So removing the wordiness of a report comes with words such as of, the, then, and many other words as well. So let's go through a couple of examples of how we can remove them and rewrite the sentence to be more concise. So if we go through the wordy example, one of the best construction benefits for using precast panels is the reduction to the on-site construction time. Now, as you can see in the air, it's quite long. So let's try and rewrite this again. Precast panels reduce the on-site construction time, which is one of the best construction benefits. Now, I'm not 100% happy with this sentence, and I think you can write it better again. So please comment below. The best answer and best response that I have to this, I'll mention in the next episode and give you a shout out. So please comment below and good luck. Now, let's go to another example. There is a need for more care when inspecting all the welds. Now, let's try and rewrite this. Inspect all the welds more carefully. As you can see here, by removing all those words, it makes it more clear, more concise, and easier for the built reader to read. So that's really twofold when you are writing those sentences, is read through it and making sure that you're getting rid of all those words that you don't need. And really trying to write in that active voice will really help you, as active voices are normally more concise as well, and more engaging. Another couple of phrases potentially where you're getting those wordy phrases, is phrases where it says in the order to, where you can just break this down to the simple to, or could potentially impact upon, may affect. It should be noted that just use note or please note, or just leave it out completely as you potentially don't need it. The other thing is to try and to avoid redundant words. So repetitive phrases that are not really necessary. For example, the very best. Very is not really needed in this situation. You can just say it is the best. Alternative choices can just be replaced with alternative or choices where either one of them is not needed as they're just additive on top of each other. So it's just reducing those number of words and making your writing more concise. Another area to focus on, especially when you're talking about wordiness, is you should always have diagrams and pictures. We know the phrase, a picture tells a thousand words. This is so true. So much easier sometimes to communicate through a diagram or a picture than it is to use words. So using those figures wherever it's effective is really beneficial. Another thing to avoid as well is jargon words. Now jargon words is something that you potentially use as a structural engineer day in, day out. So if you are converting to another structural engineer, using those jargon words would be okay as I'll understand what you're saying. But most of the time our communication is going to potential people that have less technical expertise that we have. So these jargon words will not be helpful unless you make it harder for the reader to read as you'll need to search what you've actually written. So trying to avoid those jargon words as much as possible and trying to break it down to the more simplest terms as well. Let's talk about editing and proofreading your work. Now this is really where you go down to polishing that bit of writing. And there's really two ways you need to do this. 
a lot of the time when I'm reading my own document, I read what the intent was and not what is actually on page. So I potentially move over errors that are actually on that page. So what can you do to address this? Give it to someone else to read. This is really effective as you get feedback on what you've actually written and they have no idea what you actually were trying to intend. So they actually read what's on that page as well. However, this is not always the case that you can actually do this. So something that is really effective that I found really beneficial for me is to have the computer read back to you. So in Word or other documents, you can actually set it up to actually read back what you've actually written. And by hearing it, you actually hear what is actually on that page and so that you're able to rewrite it wherever possible. What you should also be doing is looping over that document to be happy with it. So potentially sticking with different phrases or certain sentences in certain areas and just looping over and over until you're happy before moving on to the next phase. As if you go too big, you'll potentially miss errors above and you won't be able to go back and update. There is another thing that I also do and there's a program called Grammarly out there. If you are having issues with those grammar suggestions, I would highly recommend you go and pick up this program. This program is like Spellchecker, but a really boosted up version of Spellchecker beyond what Word actually has. It does a couple of things. It allows you to set the tone of the writing. So who you're trying to form this for? Is this casual? Is this formal? Is this technical? It also pick up grammatical errors and also pick up where the passive and active voices are when fragmented of sentences and potentially help you rewrite them. So I really recommend you go and check out this program. It's been highly effective for me to improve my communication. If you're looking to progress your communication skills further, I'll give a link to a couple of books that I highly recommend. The first being The Softest New Hard by Leah Murtha. She's a communication expert based in Australia and she actually gets contracted out to other companies to help with their communication strategies. It's a really effective book and not only focuses on written communication, but also focuses on verbal as well. Another book that I also recommend is Never Split the Edition by Christopher Voss. He was a former negotiator for the FBI. He actually goes through some strategies about how you can help make people go for your point of view. So I recommend these books highly. There's another two books that I'd also highly recommend as well. The next being The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. This is a, who's a really good book that takes it from a modern approach. And the other one, which is an old one, but is really standing the test of time, is How to Win Friends and Influence People. I really recommend you pick up all these books and really take in what they have to say. Anyway, I hope you liked this episode. And if you did like this content, please like, comment, subscribe. It helps get this content out to more people. And I really enjoy it and look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Bye.